My portion is on pediatric preventive care. And I'm just going to tell you really quickly my background is as a pediatric nurse practitioner and a pediatric nurse. I started out my professional nursing career at Hennepin County Medical Center in the pediatrics inpatient department. And then I worked for 12 years at La Clinica on the west side of uh, St. Paul at Community, West Side Community Health Services as a pediatric nurse practitioner. And I am going to talk about my program, Child and Teen Checkups. How many people have heard the acronym EPSDT? Anybody? Okay. So EP, EPSDT is Early Periodic Screening Diagnosis and Treatment. It is a federal program that was created when Medicaid was created back in the 1960s. And it's essentially to ensure that children who qualify for Medicaid or medical assistance receive appropriate preventive well child health screenings. What I really want you to walk away with is not only knowing what child and teen checkups, the purpose of child and teen checkups, and being able to talk about the screening components, but I really would like you to be able to explain to families why it is important to have these screenings and um, specific, why specific components are important as well. So EPSDT, uh, as I mentioned before, is a federal program that began in the 1960s when Medicaid uh, became part of the federal uh, program, became a federal program. And it's actually, each state has its own version, and our version is child and teen checkups. And EPSDT stands for early because we really want these preventive health screenings to begin at birth. The earlier we do the screenings, the quicker we um, are able to identify uh, concerns and get treatment. And the earlier the child gets treatment, the better the outcome. Periodic because children change. What a child is doing and how a child looks at one year old is way different than what's going on with them at two, three, five, seven. So if you only do a screening at one time during that child's life, you're not going to pick up concerns that may develop later. And screening is really doing testing on their physical condition, mental, social, emotional, developmental, dental, hearing, vision, and many other screenings. And diagnosis happens after you do the screening. And in a lot of instances, screenings aren't necessarily all being done at a clinic setting. There's a lot of these screenings that are being done in Head Start, in public health settings. And when those screenings are performed somewhere other than a medical provider's clinic, what is occurring is the screening is detecting concerns. And once a concern is uh, identified, those children need to go on for diagnosis and evaluation. And hopefully they will receive, a, receive appropriate treatment and intervention. So once again, their screening, as I mentioned, in identification or identifying that there is a concern that needs further evaluation and diagnosis. The child receives treatment and the goal really is better outcomes for children and their families because children don't exist in a vacuum. They exist in the context of their family. And if a child is having um, problems, it really does affect the whole family. It's not just the child. So <coughs> Minnesota, as I mentioned before, is the Minnesota version of the federal program EPSDT. And any child who's eligible for Medicaid is eligible for child and teen checkups. So that's newborn through 20 years of age. And it can change, who's eligible can change um, through the legislature, both in Minnesota and federally. And for example, the Affordable Care Act made about, increased the number of children who were eligible for child and teen checkups in Minnesota. And so about 40,000 more children got enrolled in Medicaid 
last year in 2015. So we now have about 540,000 eligible children in Minnesota. And the program, the Medicaid payout, the billing, the coding, all of the administrative um, details of child and teen checkups is actually handled by the Department of Human Services. And then they contract with the Minnesota Department of Health to um, have us do the technical assistance and the training and work with providers on how to um, ensure, to ensure that providers are doing the screening components appropriately and doing complete child and teen checkup exams. So first off, uh, what is a preventive health screening? It's quick, it's simple. And what we're really looking at is we're not looking for children who already have, cons that we already can tell has something going on. What we're trying to pick up is these kids who look like they're doing okay, but without a screening, we wouldn't know that maybe they have a mild hearing loss. Maybe they can't see as well. Maybe there's a social emotional issue that's going on. And maybe the parents have concerns and maybe they don't. But through the screening, we're able to identify those kids who otherwise would not be identified. So basically, we're looking for health risk factors, asymptomatic disease conditions. And then the other thing we do with screenings, hopefully, is we focus on what's going right for these families. Children who are eligible for Medicaid, they're, um, they're in low-income families. And a lot of times, those families have a lot of stressors. And they don't get to hear what's going right for them, or that somebody recognizes what, what is positive about their lives. And we want to be able to not only um, pick up what's, what needs to be addressed, but we want to support these families to realize that they do have some strengths. And once again, screening is not a diagnosis. It's identifying a physical or developmental concern that needs further evaluation. Um, and possibly a diagnosis. So I want you to be aware of our, we have a web page for preventive health care at if you go to MDH and then you just type in preventive health care for children, it should bring you to this page. And here is um, some information just on well child care, what that is. And then child and teen checkups our program. And if you click on the child and teen checkups, uh, link, it will bring you to, um, I last count, 140 pages. So, but it's really broken down by all of these various screening components, which I'm going to go over today. Um, and just so that you're aware, we do have something called fact sheets that goes through each one of these um, screening components. So we have a new schedule as of March. Um, 2016. So this should, this is really what I'm going to go over today. And a couple things about this. First of all, how many people have heard of the American Academy of Pediatrics? All right. So the American Academy of Pediatrics is the professional organization that writes policies and basically um, says this is evidence-based practice. This is what pediatricians should be doing. And they publish an age-related screening standards for preventative health care that looks very similar to this. And so even if a pediatrician isn't taking care of a child on Medicaid, they're following a schedule very similar to this. Everybody's heard about well child checks, right? Well, this is, this is, this Age-related screening standards are for children who are on Medicaid in Minnesota. And this is what we require and recommend in order to say that a child has had a complete well-child, ch well child and teen checkup screening. Um, <clears throat> but most of the components and most of the recommendations are the same as what the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends. The difference is that there's some requirements that pediatricians or medical um, providers, whether they're nurse practitioners or physician's assistants or doctors, have to do in order to get 
uh, payment for a complete child and teen checkup. So first of all, all of the comp screening components are on the left side column. And that's what I'm going to discuss. And then each age bracket, each column that's different colored is a different age bracket. In infancy, early childhood, middle childhood, and adolescence. And then there's little columns for each age in, in those um, age groups. Couple things about this. The black dots represent a required component that a provider or a screener needs to complete in order for it to be considered a complete child and teen checkup. The R's are recommended components that need to be performed um, in order to, they get extra reimbursement if they perform it and they don't, it's considered a complete child and teen checkup even if they don't but it's strongly recommended that they do those components. Um, different ages have different required components, but there's some requirements that go across ages, such as height and weight, uh, health history, anticipatory guidance, immunization review. So, and then there's little X's, and those are risk assessments, and those are performed per the age, all it is is this it's an assessment as to whether that child needs screening for that particular concern. And then finally, under the hearing and newborn screening, you'll see these little marks that look like a double cross. And that's basically a prompt that the provider or whoever is working with the family in that screening setting talks to the family about and actually gets information from the hospital about did that child pass their uh, newborn hearing screen? Uh, what were the results of their blood spot screening and their critical congenital heart screen? Oh, and I just want to bring your attention that this blue part up here, if you're looking at this uh, periodicity schedule online, that is actually a hyperlink to our fact sheets. And we have a fact sheet for each one of these components. And then on the back, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just so that you know, each one of these blue portions is um, a hyperlink to more information. For example, for autism-specific autism screening, we have a hyperlink to the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations on autism screening. So how does a child and teen checkup compare to a regular American Academy of Pediatrics well child check? Well, they're the same in that the goal is identifying concerns early and ensuring that these children receive treatment. Uh, and the, as I said before, the screening components are similar and so is the schedule. The difference is that kids who qualify for Medicaid are at a lower income and so they're at a much higher risk of having poor health due to that lower income but also study after study has found that kids who are lower income don't receive screenings as often as children who are not and they're at a much higher risk of um, going unidentified with their health concerns. So um, there are specific screenings that we recommend when those children do come in that aren't necessarily performed on all children. And one is lead, which is required at 12 months and two years. And that's basically drawing a little bit of blood from the child and checking their lead level. Hemoglobin, a blood draw for hemoglobin is also recommended for uh, young women who are having their periods because they're also at a higher risk of anemia. And I will say with the lead that the American Academy of Pediatrics does not recommend blood draws. It does recommend a risk assessment to determine whether a child is at high risk um, for lead exposure. But one of the risk factors that says, yes, you must draw lead is if the child's low income. And since all our kids are already low income, they're already high risk through the American Academy of Pediatrics. So why is early identification so important? Because um, 
Now, I'm assuming that most of you do work with adults, too. And so you know that if you catch an adult with diabetes or high blood pressure early, that um, the outcomes are much better. Well, imagine children who are developing, who, if they get intervention early, their outcome as far as their development, their cognitive, their development, their learning, everything really is optimized. So we're not just improving their health outcome, but we're actually improving the life of the child for their entire life. So it's really um, a big deal to do early identification. And late identification really means a lot of these kids who do not get identified in early childhood show up on the doorstep of schools and then that first kindergarten year is, is really having to deal with what was not treated or not identified earlier. All right. Oh. So now um, I'm going to show you a video, hopefully, <coughs> of um, early identification and why it's important in this particular example is a vision um, example. And I want you to pay attention to what the parent thinks is going on with this child. Um, and I will give you a little caveat that if you just ask a parent, do you have concerns about your child? The research has showed that only about 50% of the time the parents are going to say, yes, I have a concern when something's really going on. But if a parent comes to you or you're working with a parent and they say, I have a concern, 80% of the time, that parent is right. So Sam's mother, was she worried about his vision? No. And I think that that's pretty, like I said, about half the time that's what what the truth is, is that the parents don't pick it up. And the other thing is kids won't tell you. They, they've they lived with this. This is the thing about screening children, different than adults. Adults are, I feel terrible, what's going on? Kids have lived with this. They don't know that this isn't normal. I saw at one of my trainings, a mother spoke up and said that her son was diagnosed. In one eye, he had 20-20 vision. The other was 2600, his left eye. And he was at seven years old by the time they picked it up. And she said to him, why didn't you tell me that you couldn't see out of your left eye? Do you know what he said? Whoa, you can see out of your left eye? <laughs> so anyways, um, just be aware that one of the reasons why we're screening children is because they won't tell you because they don't know that it's not normal what's going on with them, how they feel, um, what's going on with them physically. Another reason why we like to screen children early is we're born with just about all the brain cells we're ever going to have in our life. What we don't have in those early years and what's occurring and part of the reason why the skull grows so big and the brain is growing is because of those connections between the nerve cells. They're called synapses, but I'm going to just refer to them as connections between the nerve cells. And the way those connections are formed is as a child experiences uh, visual input, as their mother talks to them, as they have that experience of being held and talked to and touched, and they get to explore their environment, they're making neural connections. Anything that allows them to explore their environment and learn and have good social connections and be able to do the things that they need to do is going to optimize their ability to make those neural connections. So this is a vision and hearing, this is language, higher cognitive functioning, and here's before birth and here's one year of age and you can see how many of those connections um, typically get formed in that first year of life but they're getting formed in those early years up into early elementary school, and we're still making neural connections, but a lot of the really rapid growth in that area begins in early childhood. And now, um, <coughs> 
here's a little boy who has hearing aids and I just want you to see and kind of just even picture what's going on as far as his um, connections as he gets his hearing aids in. And you know, um, a lot of things were going on in that, um, in that video. Not only was the child able to hear, but he had a mother who was responsive to him, who was interacting with him. So you can even think about a mother who is depressed, who's not working with that child. Um, all of that, there's many things that can be going on that really contribute to that child's ability to um, do well. Okay, I'm going to go into the screening components and I'm probably going to go really quickly through this. And um, you have most of the information in your slides bank, but what I'm going to try and pick out is resources that you can use and kind of talking points that you could give families about certain screening components, okay? All right, so anticipatory guidance is one of the um, components and this may be, this is an area where I do see child uh, community health workers uh, working with providers and families in giving anticipatory guidance. We have a fact sheet that is basically has a lot of hyperlinks to handouts that you can give families on various topics. And also the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has an entire area on positive parenting and um, parenting information. So if you just did uh, CDC positive parenting, you would find a lot of great resources. Zero to 20 years of age, they just cover the whole gamut. Um, so height and weight is required at all visits. Head circumference or measuring uh, the size of the child's head is requ a required component zero to two years of age. Body mass index looking at the height in proportion to weight is two years and older and then blood pressure screening uh, begins at three years of age. The World Health Organization growth chart is recommended for children zero to two and then the CDC growth cur curve should be used for kids two and older because it has the BMI um, growth curve on it. And the CDC has a, has a link, um, if you just do growth curve CDC, you'll get a link to uh, both of those growth curves. Health history, I'm not gonna go really deep into except that this is a form, that this is something that parents should fill out a complete health history at the first visit, and then it really needs to be reviewed at every screening visit um, and updated. And risk assessment is part of the history taking, but I'm also going to talk about specific risk assessments that are required <laughs> for child and teen checkups. A physical exam, so you go for your child's well child check and they get put in a gown and the provider should be doing, you're not going to have a teenager completely unclothed. However, we do want to make sure that both the mouth is looked into, even though some providers might say, well, that's what a dentist does. We want the provider to look at, look at their teeth and their mouth. We also want the genital areas to be assessed. We want a sexual development assessment to occur. And there's um, several reasons. There's conditions that occur early in childhood um, that little girls can have uh, issues that may have, make it difficult for them to urinate. Older girls may look sexually mature, but they're not having their periods and the provider needs to figure out what's going on with them. And then young men, have a lot of questions and concerns. And if you don't even go there and you don't have the conversation, they're going to walk around with those concerns and they're going to be getting that information from their buddies. Um, <clears throat> immunizations should be reviewed at every visit. And if vaccines are due or they're behind schedule, 
they should be um, given at that visit or if the parent refuses or there's a reason why they're not given that's documented. Um, so these are all the screenings that occur and when you're talking to parents about what a child and teen checkups involves, I just want you to be aware of uh, these components. And then a blood lead level, as I mentioned before, is required to be drawn somewhere between 9 and 15 months and 16 and 30 months. And if that child, if they got their 24 month lead level, but they didn't get their 12 months, they don't need another. But if they didn't get one drawn at that two year old visit and they're three, four or five years old, they should get a lead level drawn because lead really affects developing brains. So think about, back to me talking about those neural connections, essentially, bottom line, lead will interfere with the child's ability to develop those neural connections. I'll tell you, when I first started working in the clinic, I didn't know what a child and teen checkups was, and the parents kept bringing in these papers and saying, I need this. <laughs> but, and I didn't, and this is how clueless I was, I was actually, um, at the, when I first began in the clinic, there was a whole different, it looked totally different. But I was doing it. I was following the child and teen checkup requirements. But when a parent came in and said, I want a child and teen checkup, I didn't make the connection. So that's another thing that you can tell them is that sometimes the provider will be doing all of these things, but they won't necessarily know that it's a child and teen checkup. All right. So lower income children, because they tend to live in older housing, are at a lot higher lit risk um, for exposure to lead. And then another caveat, even though you're not in the clinic um, sitting there watching what's going on, you can tell the parents that it's very good to make sure that the child's hands are clean before they get their blood stick, because it may show, them, show that they have an elevated uh, lead because they had dirt on their hands. So, um, that's important too. And anything above five micrograms per deciliter does require further evaluation. So this is another place where you can do education with the family is just talking to them if they do have an elevated lead, how important it is to get that dietary counseling and um, talk to public health. And then I just want to be, this is sort of off topic, but um, Osley said, keep it in. So the Minnesota Department of Health Lead Screening Prevention Program uh, issued new recommendations for pregnant and breastfeeding women because they were finding that a lot of immigrant and refugee communities were using traditional medicines and traditional skin preparations that actually have lead in them and that there was a fair number of women that were actually being exposed to lead while they were pregnant. And that also can affect the development of the baby. So the recommendation is to do a risk assessment to see if the women are at risk of lead exposure and if they are, that they get their blood drawn. If their blood was over that five micrograms per deciliter, which is the cutoff for it being a, a level that we follow up on, if their lead blood lead level was greater than five micrograms, that infant should get their blood tested at birth and not wait until the nine to 12 months the child and teen checkups recommends. Because remember, I showed you that curve of the brain development in the first year of life. If you wait till nine to 12 months, it could uh, significantly affect that neural development. Oh, what did I just do? Okay. Um, and then breastfeeding, mothers who do have an elevated level, but it's below 40 micrograms per deciliter actually can breastfeed because not much lead gets into the breast milk. However, um, they should make sure that they talk to a provider and the provider decides based on what the infant's blood lead level is as well. So hemoglobin, we require screening once at nine to 15 months of age, and at least once when a young woman's having her periods, it's best not that she just had one period because she's not going to get anemia from one period. Typically, um, we want to make sure that they've had a few before they get tested. And then you really want to, if you're working with families, you can talk about diet 
and that connection to anemia and what the family's history of anemia is. Yes? The hematocrit. What's a hematocrit? It's the same as a hemoglobin. Um, they do two tests, but they both correlate together. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And then also you want to get the mother's um, menstrual history. So anticipatory guidance, I have this in because if a mother is exclusively breastfeeding her infant, um, you need to talk to her about talking to her provider and making sure that at a certain age that infant should be getting iron drops. In addition, um, if you're working with families who have toddlers who are not eating a lot of solid food and they're walking around with a bottle in their mouth all the time, you need to know that anything over 24 ounces of milk a day puts that child at risk of anemia. So talking to the family about getting them to eat more solid food and not drink an excessive amount of milk. Um, and then talking about high iron diet, you can go to the CDC Iron um, and Iron Deficiency Anemia website for information. We also have a fact sheet on the MDH website. One other little announcement about iron. There's a very fine line between the amount of iron that's helpful and the amount of iron that's toxic. For women and children who are taking iron supplements, those supplements need to be kept out of reach of those children because it doesn't take much for it to be toxic to a young child. Um, there's a risk assessment on the Minnesota Department of Health uh, webpage, and I showed you that Preventive Health uh, website has a link to the, the TB program and this risk assessment. And then if the child is been shown to be positive for um, exposure to tuberculosis or potential exposure, they should get either a skin test if they're over six months of age um, or a blood test, but this is only for children five years and older is the blood test. Nice thing about the blood test is if the child had, uh, was born in another country where they had an immunization to tuberculosis, this blood test won't show up positive like the skin test sometimes does. And the other thing is, is that the family, if you think, the, if the, if you think this family is not going to come back in 42 to 78 hours and get the mantle read, or you're not going to be able to read the mantle, um, the blood test doesn't require that type of follow-up. All right, sexually transmitted infections. Now, I know that we're talking about early childhood, um, basically, but I really... Um, think that this is an important take-home fact is all children 11 years of age and older, yes, um, should be given a risk assessment for sexually transmitted infections. And that's basically asking the child, are they sexually active? And I know that for a lot of people it's like, well, of course they're not. But this question still needs to be asked, and it needs to be asked in private because they're not probably going to say anything in front of their parents. So at 11 years of age, the American Academy of Pediatrics and Child and Teen Checkups does recommend having a conversation with that child privately about how things are going for them. There's things they're just not going to say with the parent in the room but it's important to find out. And um, what we recommend is screening all sexually active females for chlamydia. And we have a STI fact sheet and there is a sexually transmitted infection uh, program at the Minnesota Department of Health. And what I wanna show you is Chlamydia in Minnesota is increasing <coughs> astoundingly. Every year we have about 2,000 more cases than we had the year before. And this is only 14% of the population in 2010 by the Census Bureau uh, were between 15 and 24 years of age. However, in 2015, 15 to 24 year olds uh, accounted for 63% of the chlamydia infections. So even if you feel like your son and daughter 
is not doing it, allowing the provider to have that conversation is really important. Chlamydia oftentimes is asymptomatic and for young women, if they have one chlamydia infection, 8%, they have an 8% chance of being infertile. If they have three infections, it's up to 80%. I mean, it really is significant um, impact to these young women if they don't get treated. And so um, hopefully providers, I, I would get fairly specific about what that meant. And that's another reason why having that conversation confidentially is so important because, oh my gosh, can you imagine the teen listening to that explanation from their parents, really? <laughs> you know? So um, it's important. Uh, and yes, it should be said in a way where the teen actually understands and understands the impact. And I would go into a little bit of you know, it doesn't matter if you only did it one time, you don't know how many times that person did it and who they did it with and blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's important. Okay, newborn screening, I'm not gonna go too much into it, but it is um, something providers need to check on. And then with hearing screening, it's very important that the provider really checks on that until the child is able to get tested. But blood spot and clinical critical congenital heart disease. Most of the time the heart disease is picked up and followed up in the um, hospital, but all these things need to be reviewed at that first visit and here's the telephone numbers. Um, hearing screening, once again, the newborn hearing screen should be in the child's chart. A risk assessment, there's a lot of conditions where the child passes their newborn hearing screening, they're not having a problem at birth, but then Later on, it, um, the condition that would affect their hearing starts to show up and they start to have problems. So um, certainly reviewing risk factors by the Joint Committee on Infant Hearing. The child, the physician should actually look in the child's ear or the medical provider. And then pure tone audiometry screening is recommended at three years of age. It's required at every child and teen checkup visit between four and 14 years and at 18. And then you can just see when it's recommended and required. And vision screening, a risk assessment once again, especially before um, three years of age when visual acuity can be screened, physical exam of the eye, and then vision screening is required at three years of age to 14 and at 18, age 18 as well. Oral health, so the provider and you also can tell the parents that it's very important that the children get a visit with the dentist as soon as they have one tooth. Not when they're three years old, okay? When they have one tooth, and if they were born with teeth, they should see a dentist when they're pretty young, okay? You want to protect those teeth. and. Um, you want to talk to families about um, sealants when they're six to 12 years of age because not all kids are candidates for sealants, but if they have a lot of uh, pits or grooves in their permanent teeth, the sealants can prevent um, caries. And fluoride varnish application is recommended at the eruption of the first tooth. And here's the thing about fluoride varnish. They paint it on, it's painless for the infant, and it actually binds to the teeth as soon as there's saliva. So the saliva doesn't wash the fluoride off, it binds it. So even a very young infant can have fluoride varnish safely, and they should be getting it as soon as they have teeth, um, every three to six months up to six years of age. For infants, we recommend maternal depression screening. So the uh, medical provider in the infant's visit can provide the mother with depression screening to see if that mom's depressed. Remember what I said about if the mom isn't interacting with the baby, the baby's not going to develop those neural connections. So it's very important. It is very individual what's going on. When I was a nurse many, many years ago, we had a mother severely depressed who had 
two children very close together and no support. And that second infant she didn't bring in until nine months. And she was so unbonded with that infant, she just left the infant in a crib and fed her, and that was it. And that infant didn't even cry. She didn't know that it was okay to, that if she cried, somebody would come to her. But it was amazing to watch that child. Her head actually grew as soon as she came. But that mother didn't bring that child in for visits. So one of the, this is one of the reasons why it's so important for you to be here and hearing this, because it's really about, the mother may not know that she's depressed, and postpartum depression happens to the most functional of people. It's partly hormonic, you know, hormones, and it's not necessarily because there's something wrong with them, but they may not want to say there's something going on. There may be a lot of taboos against talking about it, so many things. So it's so important that you talk to them. And they may not notice that they're bonded with their infant or their infant isn't doing what would be expected. So yes, you'd think that the provider would pick it up, but once again, if you have 10 minutes for an appointment without doing this maternal depression screening, you may not. And then social emotional screening, you can look on your, um, chart there and see when it's recommended. Social emotional uh, begins at <laughs> six months um, and then developmental screening is recommended beginning at nine months. We do now recommend autism screening that's new on this schedule and we also recommend social emotional and developmental screening and then mental health screening for um, early uh, for school age and adolescents. Really quickly You'll notice that it says surveillance right here on developmental screening and it's in mental health and it's all the way across. Surveillance is basically asking the parents if they have a concern and you already know what the statistics are on that. And it's also just the prov medical provider eyeballing the child, looking at what the child's doing and determining whether there's a concern. But we can't always detect a concern just by looking at the child. That's why we do screening, right? Screening requires the use of a standardized tool for development, social, emotional. And child and teen checkup recommended tools are assessed for, are they valid? Are they reliable? Can you screen over and over and get the same results? Are they specific to that problem that we're trying to screen <coughs> for? Is it gonna pick up that problem and not whether they can, uh, identify an umbrella or something else. <coughs> and then is it sensitive? Is it really picking up the kids we're concerned about without um, identifying the kids that we're not? Mental health screening, once again, this is for older kids, but I'm just throwing it in there, is um, recommended six through 20 years of age. And a lot of studies have found that about a fifth of kids experience mental, emotional, or behavioral disorders at any given time, but 80% of them are not identified and not receiving services. And suicide is the second leading cause of death for 10 to 19 year olds in Minnesota. And in 2013, uh, the Minnesota Student Survey asked kids about had they tried to attempted suicide in the past year and only a third of those kids who had attempted suicide were actually receiving services. So that is extremely important. Substance use risk assessment um, is also recommended starting at age 11 and there's a couple tools that are recommended for that screening. So just a real quick thing, um, if you go to the Department of Human Services website, you can get a list of um, coordinators for your area and these coordinators will help the families if they get a referral with an interpreter service, transportation, if there's bar other barriers <coughs> to the family making those appointments, they can help out and you can contact them and talk to them. All right, so this is our resources and this is my contact information. Feel free to contact me, faithkidder at state.mn.us, 
if you have any questions. And thank you for your time.